begin, the Mets continue a 10-game road trip in San Francisco where they'll face Buster Posey and the Giants. Gone! Buster Posey! The Mets and Giants, Saturday at 3 Eastern and Sunday at 7 Eastern on ESPN Radio. The topics are hot. The discussion is heated. And we're on fire. The First Take Podcast starts now. Good day. Happy Friday, everybody. Coming up on the First Take Podcast, we'll react as James Harrison calls NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell a crook. Plus, do more white athletes need to speak up for the Black Lives Matters movement? Somebody was called out. We'll tell you who that is and by whom. And why Kevin Durant says not caring actually makes him a better player. Oh, it's my favorite day of the week. We almost made it to the weekend, but first, first take on a Friday. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for hanging with us. Max Kellerman, Stephen A. Smith. Molly Karam, up, how we dude? doing? How, how y'all are doing? I'm good. Let's go. Let's get Let's into get it. On. Coming up, guess who's joining us? WWE superstar Seth Rollins will be in the house. Stay tuned for that. So much to get into with him. But first, we're going to kick things off in the National Football League. Here's the latest. James Harrison, Clay Matthews, and Julius Peppers have agreed to meet with NFL investigators, according to our Chris Mortensen. The league had threatened suspension if the players failed to meet regarding PED allegations stemming from an Al Jazeera report, sources have told ESPN. So Harrison has agreed to meet. It's August 30th at the team facility via a letter sent by the NFLPA to the NFL, which was acquired by ESPN. He's set conditions, though, limiting questions to only the segment cited in the Al Jazeera report in which he was identified. It is still uncertain if the league will accept these allegations. Here's Harrison on the situation. If it goes to a, a, a you know a kind of detrimental, it, it, it leans to the hands of that crook. I mean, of uh, uh, Roger Goodell and. Uh, you know, he can do whatever he wants, you know. I mean, that's just a collective bargaining agreement that the players signed. I've been prosecuted and persecuted, you know, publicly in the media by them for something that I didn't do. So, I mean, I don't see why we couldn't have the media there and do a live interview. They can ask their questions and I can answer them. And, and y'all can see whatever evidence it is they say they got or don't have. Harrison seems hot. The crook, Roger Goodell, inbounds or out of bounds? Um, he's out of bounds. Uh, there's no question in my mind about it. Um, you know, first of all, the word crook implies that somebody stole something from you. Now, this is an individual, James Harrison, has been fined in excess of $150,000 over the years. So we would understand the vitriol, the venom, the hostility that he feels towards the commissioner. We're not even going to sit here and act like it's not invalid, that it's not valid. Because it is valid to some degree. You might feel like the penalties have been excessive, that you didn't deserve some of those penalties. But it's still out of bounds because of the commissioner. It's still out of bounds because of some of the other things that James Harrison requires in terms of, you know, suggesting the media show up and, you know, do a, a, a public inquisition or whatever the case may be. As far as I'm concerned, if I were Roger Goodell, I wanted to send a message. I would suspend James Harrison right now. I would not wait until the 25th. I would not wait until the 26th. What's the day's day? What's the day's day? What's the day's 19th. day? The 19th. The 19th. I would suspend him right now. Literally, right now. You think you're that bad? Let's go. Let's roll. Let's see how deep your pockets are. Let's see how deep the Players Association's pocket is. Because, you see, it shows that you're not living in the real world. Now, James Harrison is not the only professional athlete who is devoid of this level of sense in this regard. You have Major League Baseball players that have pulled this on occasions in the past. A lot of times we find ourselves asking who the hell do they think they are. So this is not about James Harrison per se. It's not to cast aspersions on him. It's just to really identify the irrationality associated with everything. Max, that's what this comes down to. You are a football player. You play under the shield of the NFL. Your owner, okay, the Rooney family, I did not hear any of them coming out in support of you against Roger Goodell because they understand protocol. Robert Kraft may have came out in support of Tom Brady, but it was after he was willing to accept the consequences that was bestowed upon Tom Brady by Commissioner Roger Goodell, even though he disagreed with it, even though he was on record disagreeing with it. At the end of the day, you're not bigger than the product. You're not bigger than the brand. And I think this is one of those situations where James Harrison is going to have to learn that you're talking about. You've agreed to talk to them. We appreciate that. They're coming to the Steelers camp. We appreciate that. But when you say stuff the way that he has said things and essentially insisting on the media literally showing up for the Inquisition. Well, if you think that's all right to say to your boss publicly, 
Good luck with that. Is that why you're suspending him right now, because of the comments? Well, yeah, exactly, okay. because of the comment. Because what I'm saying is, first of all, if James, ha James Harrison is somebody that I find to be a real dude, a real man, an honorable man, so if you feel, if you know that you are innocent of PED use, I have no problem with the disgust. I have no problem with you proclaiming publicly your innocence. What I have a problem with is how he has acted in all this. You've dragged this on. You've gone through extreme measures, as far as I'm concerned, in speaking out against the commissioner to a point where it, it, it definitely does. It, it doesn't border on insubordination. I think it exceeds it. Now, one would argue Roger Goodell is not his boss. He's the commissioner. But the commissioner has the power bestowed upon him by all of your bosses, which are the owners, which makes him the boss. And so that's just the way that it goes to me. If I'm Roger Goodell, I'm sending a message to be quite honest with you. I would, I'm not saying I would definitively do it because he is, he, he can speak his mind, but I would strongly consider suspending him right now just to make a damn point. You are wrong about every single thing you just said. I'm listening. The, even the one thing that you got right, you got, you, you're wrong about. He said crook. You said you can understand the vitriol because he's been fined, whatever, but when, you're right. Once you say crook, you're saying someone's got, took something from you illegal or, or stole something. That's just name calling, and unless James Harrison could be specific, what exactly did Roger Goodell steal? Now people are not going to be able to really hear what you're saying because they're just going to hear the word crook, which seems to me to be the one part that's out of bounds. About everything else, it's quite the opposite, Stephen A. Look, first, you seem to be into this idea that might makes right. Because Goodell does have the power to suspend him, or whether or not he actually has that power in the CBA, which is actually an issue here, he will suspend him, and then they're going to have to appeal. That's true, but because he has that power, James Harrison should just cave? I mean, the, 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 NF, the, the Players Association is, I believe, based on what I've read, correctly interpreting the CBA, saying, look, you're in the evidence-gathering process, don't have to talk to you yet unless you have evidence. If you're going to say the Al Jazeera report is evidence, fine, use that. But I don't have to talk. Okay, wait, you want me to talk to you? Okay, fine, I'll be the bigger person here. In the interest of transparency and kind of common sense approach, I'll talk to you. However, if we're going to do that, there are going to be some stipulations because I am not required to talk to you according to the CBA. That's their interpretation, Harrison's, the Players Association, and I agree with them. But okay, we're going to do this. How are we going to do this? We're going to limit the questions to this inquiry because this is not going to be an inquisition, as you, I think, it correctly termed it, that otherwise it becomes an inquisition. It's going to be an inquiry about limited to the, the scope will be limited to these questions, and I'll be a good sport and do it. But because I don't trust you, which is his right, he shouldn't call him a crook, but he's, it's his right not to trust him, I want the media there documenting this so that later on when the league claims as they have in the past that some things were said and then the player says no other things were said we all know exactly what was said and since he is not compelled by the CBA to talk to Roger Goodell in his opinion in the Players Association opinion in my opinion and other independent people opinion he doesn't have to do this it's within his right to say if I do this here are the stipulations right you can say it was in this right, but let's dissect this just a little bit, okay? First of all, don't give me the Players Association. The Players Association will say he's wrong for passing gas for crying out loud because they want anything they can to take the court because it seems like, you know what, the more we go to court, the more lawyer fees are piled up, those billable hours, and somebody's going to get paid for it. Hey, Jeffrey Kessler, how you doing, buddy? How you doing? That's point number one. <laughs> point number two, when you look at it from James Harrison's perspective, this man has been fined six times for in excess of $150,000 dating back to last year. They're talking about dating going as far back as 2010. There's some animosity, some vitriol there. There is such a thing as practicality that needs to enter the equation here. Who amongst us gets to go upstairs and say, well, you know what? We want to sit up there and, 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 and make sure the media is involved and the public at large is privy to the conversations that we have with our boss. I'm talking from a realistic perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking utopia. Let me ask you a question, for the, rhetorically or otherwise. How many times would you like to have had eyewitnesses in attendance when you've had conversations with bosses? You know, where you wish, prayed that somebody was there. You wish there was a fly on a wall. You wish there was some secret recording somewhere. You wish that the words that they said 
actually became full Time out. came to fruition. Listen, all I'm saying so because is, you can't no, have that, he no, shouldn't no, have it no, either. No, no, no. He, he exactly. Let me explain. You are a football player. Roger Goodell is the commissioner. You are. You do have the right to have union representation. You do have the right to have an attorney in all likelihood to sit up there and to say, well, if Roger Goodell's going to question me, I would like the media to be in attendance yeah. for that. So in other words, let me ask you this question. Is everything about these guys squeaky clean? What if Roger Goodell turned around and said, let me invite the media in when I do have evidence to get y'all using PEDs or, or, or DUIs or domestic violence. Or the, what the, I don't hear. I didn't hear a whole bunch. But of here's people, the difference. Hold on, wait a minute. I didn't hear a whole bunch of people standing up then wishing that the commissioner was, you know, was 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 on tape for that. There's a whole bunch of because stuff. Because James Harrison right. believes he doesn't have to submit to this interview. So if right. he's going to do it, there's going to be stipulation and at stipulations. And as to your point of view, that because it's not pragmatic, it's not practical. The reality is this is the boss. Who are you? You're just a football player. The media, this certainly doesn't apply to you, what I'm about to say, but sure. this is applied to the media, uh, much of the American media in the past. Baseball, which was the first real strong union in sports that, that sued and got free agency and all these things. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, the press's basic point of view towards the worker, and this is in many walks of life, but especially in sports, mm -hmm. back then was, why, you're playing a child's game. You should be happy you get to play that for pay. Who are you to ask for what your market you value? You should take that. what Mr. So-and-so right. gives you. But it's part of the same spirit of that. Because this guy is the boss, because he thinks he's able to unilaterally enforce rules Five. that the union disagrees with, you should just submit to it time because out. the time fight out. will be difficult. Time out, time out, time out. You just lied to because the Because you're just, just a player. You just lied to the American public. Who are you? False, and here's why. You use the word unilateral. There is nothing that Roger Goodell feels that is unilateral. Roger Goodell clearly doesn't believe it's a unilateral decision because there's a collective bargaining agreement that was reached. Both sides. What he believes is that his interpretation of that collective bargaining agreement is accurate. That doesn't mean it's a unilateral decision. Oh, oh, wait, wait. wait a minute. So, but, is, but you're saying, so, but the but, players also feel that way. So you're uh, saying when that uh, happens, no. they have to defer to the commissioner. No, no, no you're wrong. Because, so he's the no, judge, no, jury, no, and executioner. Let me, uh, before you rudely interrupt it, allow me to educate you. I am saying to you that the Players Association can make that argument what they, all they want to. Yeah. What they are really fighting is not the interpretation of the CBA. What they're fighting is the fact that they never gained the power that they wish they had from that CBA because they lost that battle because they wanted to strip the commissioner of his power. They were unsuccessful, so they have retroactively gone about the business of trying to diminish his cash. So you believe in, in you. So in other words, I believe that the players have correctly interpreted this CBA in their, uh, you know, in right. from their point of view. And you believe Goodell has correctly. Not, so we just have a disagreement no, no, on the CBA. No, what we have a disagreement on is this. In the end, the CBA grants Goodell a level of power and latitude that the Players Association religiously tries tries to fight retroactively of the agreement that they made. Uh, from years that's ago. That's not what the CBA the, says the, in this the, case. I'm telling you. It's just like with the that, Tom, that's true what you just, said, but it's just like with the Tom, It's just like with the Tom Brady situation. I have it on good authority that there were several people, several people associated with players throughout the league and, in, 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 you know, NFL, PA to some degree, who absolutely believed that Tom Brady wasn't completely innocent in all of it, but they fought anyway, didn't they? You know why? Because that was one of their own. That's what he wanted to do, and it would be a great opportunity for them because if they were successful, it would set a new precedent that they could build upon to fight future but, cases. So what I'm saying to you is this. It ain't always, especially with a union, especially with this union, it's not always about whether somebody is right or wrong. It's a case that they could fight because the more you could peel away at the power of the commissioner, the more successful you will be. This is the conversation. This is the exact argument we're having. Mm -hmm. The analogy here is that the commissioner here is a prosecutor, essentially. The, CB, the, the NFL Players Association is the defense attorney, but you also want the commissioner or seem to think that the commissioner is also the judge and the oh, jury. No, 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 no. Because the I job think, of the NFLPA but, 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 is to but, defend but, their Max players. Max Kellerman, I don't think the commissioner is the judge, jury, and executioner. I know he is. Mm. Facts and, 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 and past cases have proven he's all three. And that's why, what the, why do you think they're fighting? Right. right. Why, why do you? Hold on. Wait, wait a minute. Right, how is this, how is there something to fight if you didn't surrender the power?
They didn't surrender the oh, power yeah. in this case. Yes, That's what that they issue. Had the, the power is and there. Yeah, You'll, right. find uh, okay. You'll find out. Right. You'll find out. You'll learn. It's going to be very You'll learn. One of us will. You'll learn. One of us will. this plays out. And You'll I learn. hope we get to the bottom of this sooner than later. Let's get to the other story that has been covered and we're tracking just about every media outlet. That would be the American swimmers. Ryan Lochte and Jimmy Fegan could still face serious charges following the robbery scandal involving four U.S. swimmers. So Rio um, civil police chief told ESPN yesterday that the investigation is continuing regarding what happened Sunday at that gas station. So the police held a press conference Thursday in Rio saying that the four lied about being robbed at gunpoint and that they vandalized a gas station bathroom and were confronted by security. The lawyer for Fegan says the swimmer will pay roughly $10,000 today, then leave Brazil. Uh, Fegan's teammates, Gunnar Benz and Jack Conger, left Brazil Thursday night after giving testimony to the police. Stephen A., what's your reaction to the latest on this? Well, my reaction to the latest of it, believe it or not, is that, first of all, we departed from yesterday's show because after we did a segment on it immediately following that news came down, reported yep. by ABC News, uh, that Lochte uh, had indeed fabricated the story according to the folks, uh, according to his teammates kept in custody by the Brazilian police. And so Lochte comes across as a flagrant liar and a straight up punk because he skipped town. Not only did he commit the crime per se of, of you know, kicking in the door, doing what, you know, vandalizing. Yep. But then, you know, skipped out of the country, all right, left two of his boys back there. So he looks, I mean, talk about looking weak. Yep. This is a man that uh, we need to hear what he has to say. But, Lord, he looks bad in all of this. He embarrassed himself. He embarrassed his team. He embarrassed the United States of America, assuming it's true. And we all believe at this juncture anyway that it is. But I bring that up because I must confess, when I heard that his teammate had to pay $10,800. I just said to myself, you know what? I'm thinking about all these problems going on in Brazil. I'm thinking about all the things that have been well chronicled, you know, monetary issues and beyond. And I just said to myself, okay, that it, it could come across as a fine, but that's pretty damn steep, you know? And I, I found myself wondering, you know, did you just sit up there and, and say what you needed to say to get the hell up out of there? Did they force you to say what, what they needed you to say just to get the hell up out of just so you could get the hell up out of there? I don't know the answer to these questions. I guess we'll find out more once they all get state, stateside. But right now, I think we lean on the interpretation of Lochte being a liar that he appears to be and how shameful it is. It was an embarrassment and a disgrace to this country. And you know what? If, if, if indeed he did lie, he doesn't need to show his face. The only reason why Lochte should show his face is to categorically uh, deny that he fabricated the story. If he indeed fabricated the story and put everybody through that going on Twitter, uh, you know, just exacerbating, this, just exacerbating the issue and, and, pro and, and stretching the story to the astronomical proportions it has been stretched to, he doesn't need to show his face if, if indeed he, he fabricated this whole thing. You know, here's Lockheed, how Lockheed's problem. From everything you hear out of his mouth, he's entitled. And look, I, what I'm about to say, I don't know him, but I'm just basing it on public statements he's made, stuff I've read and heard. He seems to have a pretty low IQ. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. it doesn't seem that smart. And, for, and a lot of times we sit here and praise athletes' intelligence. You hear Richard Sherman or Bennett or someone who seems to be interested in things and interested in the world. And or you sit down and talk with Kobe Bryant, for example, who never went to college but is worldly. He's been around the world a bunch of times. Highly and intelligent. Very, you can see when a guy has, whether or not he's been formally trained, you can see when a guy is, has a high IQ. And in this case, it looks like this guy is, that L Lochte is not one of those people. And in addition to that, is extremely entitled and therefore has no real sense of self and his kind of place in the world um, and believes he's, I guess, more important than he is. And, and I think that's what got him in trouble. He just not, it doesn't seem like the brightest not bulb. It's not okay to go into somebody's business because the, the door isn't working and just break it open and vandalize it. Well, he appears to have lied. He business. appears to have lied. And, and all of the, first of all, nobody's defending his actions. Yeah. There's no defense for it. But my goodness, how could you uh, how could you stretch it to these proportions 
and lie and turn it into an international incident. The 2016 Olympic Games, are. this is going to be the number one story that people remember for years to come. And the United States of America is associated with lies and shame because of this man. And it's so a shame it, that o overshadows what they call That overshadows everything. It overshadows everything. It doesn't erase everything because we recognize the individual athletes that have made us very, very proud, and we appreciate that. But I'm talking about in terms of what makes headlines. This is the number one story. You know, and, and by the way, in terms of like whatever legal ramifications, he does have his just desserts locked in the sense that he's now been publicly humiliated. Yep. Um, he's, he's Stephen A., you just said, I think correctly, he was, it was shameful, cowardly, whatever else. And I'm talking about the level of his intelligence here. Right. And this is being discussed on a national level by a lot of people. Uh, good luck with endorsements and everything going forward. That's just his ability can, to make how, a living. How can you, how can you get an endorsement out right. of this? Right, right. Not from this country. But, so, maybe, so, for, maybe, maybe from, I mean, if you, if you want, if, 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 if fraud is marketable, <laughs> if, if phoniness is marketable, I mean, I don't know. So his ability to make a living has been permanently, it would seem, compromised. But in addition to that, there's an ongoing public humiliation that, you know, uh, you, you don't wish on anyone, but I guess it's his just desserts. Yep. Got it. Uh, he did release a statement on, on Twitter this morning and essentially said, I can't read the whole thing, he should have been more careful and candid in how he described those events. So Good. pretty much seems like he's admitting that he did lie. Uh-oh. Kevin Durant, he showed up and showed out on Wednesday. He had 27 points while leading Team USA to a dominant victory over Argentina to advance to semifinal play against Spain today. After the game, Durant spoke on how his mindset has shifted with all the scrutiny Team USA has been under despite having an undefeated record. Quote, I told myself before I left my room, I'm at my best if I don't care if we win or lose. It might be different for other players, but for me, I'm more free and aggressive. And it's way more fun for me if I don't care about the outcome. I know if I go out there and be who I am, the outcome will dictate itself. KD staying in the moment there. What does this say about him, Stephen A? It says, it, it, it really says why he's not a champion. That's the best way to put it. Um, I mean, no disrespect. Um, I recognize and I say religiously that Kevin Durant is one of the top three players in the world. He's a superstar. Um, and his performance during the Olympics is, you know, so what? He's a career 27-point-per-game scorer. He's scoring anybody. I think Kevin Durant could go down as the leading scorer in NBA history when his career is all said and done. I think he has that kind of potential. But when you talk about champions... There's a reason why some people find themselves being champions and some reason or not. One of the reasons why, Max, I was on the record and swearing to you during the NBA Finals, Steph Curry had a bad NBA Finals to his standards as opposed to choking. I would never associate the word choke with Steph Curry because of what I saw from Steph Curry. When Steph Curry is healthy, I see an assassin. When the big moment arises, I don't see somebody who shrinks. I see somebody who wants the basketball. I see somebody who's willing to pull the trigger. Now, whether it goes in or it doesn't is a different ball game. But what you don't do is you don't disappear. You can be rendered ineffective because of competition. You can be rendered ineffective because of injury. But you don't be, be rendered ineffective because of yourself. I didn't see that with Steph Curry. I saw that with Kevin Durant. Not game seven where he waited a little bit too late to get aggressive. But definitely in game six, when he compared, appeared to be a shell of himself, when he was doing things that he doesn't normally do, where he deviated from what we knew Kevin Durant to be in terms of how he elects to play the game of basketball. So then when you combine that all and you take that into consideration and you look at the specifics, the, the specific quote that he put out there when he doesn't care whether he wins or lose, what champion do you know of that doesn't care? whether they win or lose. At some point in time, ask any, cha any champion that I have ever spoken to, at some point in time, their back was pressed against the wall. Everything was on the line. There was a level of urgency attached to it. And, you know, as a result of that, you go for it. It harkens me back to two things. One statement made by a legend in Isaiah Thomas, another meant made by 
the greatest cornerback in NFL history in primetime Deion Sanders. Primetime Deion Sanders, you recall this, Molly, because you was at the NFL Network at the mm-hmm. time. He gave his acceptance speech uh, at the Hall of Fame, was yep. Hall of Fame speech. Mm-hmm. One of the first things he did, Max, was apologize to all his family members, loved ones, and everything like that. Because he talked about the level of selfishness that he had to engage in. Because when you're locked in, all you see is that. And you are going for it. It made me think about what Isaiah Thomas had said to me years earlier. When he talked about how he had to apologize to his family. He said, because when you are locked in on championships and on winning, it consumes you to such a degree that you see nothing else, you hear nothing else, you pay attention to nothing else. It is all that matters. Every champion I've ever spoken to told me the same exact thing. We are hearing this comment from someone who has yet to capture a championship. Maybe that's the reason why. I don't think that what he actually meant was he doesn't care if he wins or loses. I didn't say he doesn't care. I think that his process to getting there, he believes the best way to get there for him, which is not for everybody, is to not think about that and concentrate on the process and then let the chips fall where they may. Now, I'm rooting for Kevin Durant to win a championship, although the fact that he joined a 73-win team, as loaded as they are, uh, that, that came so close to winning a championship, which would have been a title defense, came very close to winning, a couple minutes away from winning back-to-back titles, means even if he does win, people will question how much of that was him and how much of it was him riding the coattails of that team and just putting them over the top. Nevertheless, I would like to see Kevin Durant win because it would make the world more interesting if there was an exception to the rule. If here's the guy, you know, you take the non-centers, the greatest players of all time, Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Kobe Bryant, the retired guys, now Kobe's retired. Straight stone killers. Even Magic, who uplifted everyone around him the way LeBron did, didn't like demoralize everyone all the time like like, uh, Jordan and Bird at times and, and Kobe at times could do. Magic wanted to uplift everyone, but Magic was a stone killer, would never think, oh, I just need to play my game, is only thinking about killing the other guy. Larry Bird talked about after he beat the Lakers in the rematch. He's talking about the best part about it was knowing that Magic was in the other locker room suffering. Think about that. And they were boys by this time. And the best part of the championship is knowing your rival is suffering. That's what's best to you? A psychopath. The fact of the matter is the history of the NBA says... Only the psychopaths win on that level, and that's not Durant. So I'm rooting for Durant to do it. I think the world becomes a more interesting place if not everyone has to be cut from the same mold. It it would be just different. But make no mistake, that would be an exception. I appreciate him focusing on the process, but that's not how it's been done so far. Well, let me be very, very clear. I'm not rooting for that Durant. I have no problem with Kevin Durant. But that Durant that you just described, I'm not rooting for that dude. I don't want a bunch of people walking around not caring whether they win or lose, and that's how you you facilitate a, a path to a championship. No, I want you to care. I want it to hurt. I want it to hurt real bad. That's one of the reasons that I went off at the thought of Carmelo Anthony feeling what I thought he felt. That, 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 that DeAndre Jordan, the same thing. I want it to rake your nerves the way it would rake a fan's nerves because you're the one out there getting paid. You're the one playing. You need to care more than we do. Not to say that they don't, but you need, we need to feel that. And I, I'm not going to apologize for that. What, if, you're, what if, if your path to there is not it, focusing on the result? Yeah, what but, 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 but the just saying my path is focusing on the time, process. Time out, y'all. I preface, since you want to get in on this, Molly I Wood, do. I prefaced my comments by saying he don't have a title yet. Y'all are saying what ifs. I'm giving you facts. You're giving me emotion. You, Durant does not have a title. He is one of the greatest players in the world. Uh Top three. One of his teammates was a top five. Their team was a championship caliber team. The best roster suited to beat the Golden State Warriors, even better than Cleveland, and they lost.
And this was his ninth year in the league. Kevin Durant is a superstar. He's not some marginal player or some average player on an average team trying to get there. He was there, but he has not gotten it done. If Durant had and that's more, the point. If Durant had a little more Westbrook in him, he'd be a champion already. Wait, 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 stop I right agree, there. I that, agree that, with that, that. There we go. Stephen, there we go. He said his mindset shifted after hearing all the criticism that they were struggling. Said this is his new mindset. This is his new approach. So now he's trying to, to um, detach himself from the outcome, stay okay. focused in the moment, and execute. Right. Well, so this is new. Well, let me say this to you. I ignored the word new. That was not an accident. The reason why is because that quote explained to me what I've been seeing all of these years. I am not saying that Kevin Durant does not care about winning. I am not saying he is not a superstar. He is a superstar, and I know he cares, and he's a great ambassador for the game of basketball because he loves to just play. The flip side to it is that how many times have we watched him asking ourselves, what's missing years ago before LeBron won the title? Do you know what the best thing that ever happened to LeBron was? Losing, losing to losing Dallas. Dallas, yeah. Because when losing to San Antonio, everybody anticipated that. When he lost to the Dallas Mavericks, everyone looked at LeBron. J.J. Barea? Jason Terry defending you? How is that possible? You know what I liked about it? So what it? happened is he sat up there around Pat Riley and all of those guys, learned how to zone out the world and lock in. I was at that game six in the Eastern Conference Finals in Boston, TD Bank, when LeBron showed up looking like a man possessed, number white in his eyes, 45 and 15. This man was on, a, on another level because you know what? He was here, and that's what I'm saying needs to happen. Look. This was, is what he's saying he's doing. The, the, wor the world I was disagree. A, look, the world became a more interesting place when LeBron became champion after the Dallas debacle, precisely because when I saw that, and when many saw that, you're like, oh, LeBron, that's who you are? Choking in four consecutive fourth quarters in the NBA Finals against a team you should beat on a super team that you put together after you're saying not two, not three, not four. Man, that's disappointing. And then he showed that just because that happened once, that wasn't his fate to be a choker. Yeah. That wasn't what well, he was what made of. What did that have to so, do with the I'll tell you exactly. The world became a more interesting place when what you thought you knew turned out, no, there's an exception to that. You can overcome that. How can you not think it would be more interesting if we had at least one example of a guy who's like, no, 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 I'm not Kobe. I'm not MJ. I'm not Bird or Magic. I, I, I'm doing it a different way, and it worked. Wait, Wouldn't wait, that wait, be wait, more wait, wait, interesting? Wait, stop this. Nobody's asking the great Kevin Durant to be like anybody. What we're saying is there's an ingredient to champions. If you're making lasagna, th th I like my lasagna with some beef. We okay? Now, th there we go. L look, you can make lasagna any old which way you go. Listen, it, it requires cheese and noodles and beef and tomato sauce. Now, you can do what you want with it, but in the end, it requires beef. Cheese, noodles, Not tomato like sauce. Vegetarian. I just said if you like beef. So my point to you is that's the ingredient. All we're saying is it's and not about what beef. if someone oh, no, could cook oh, no, you wait, with lasagna wait, with wait, something wait, else? Wait, yeah. wait, 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 Wouldn't wait, that blow your mind? It was good. Listen, listen, let me tell y'all this right now. When it happens, it happens. All I'm saying to you is that this ain't some rookie. This is a dude that's been in the league for a decade. And all I'm trying to say to y'all is that we have watched him in moments where we asked ourselves what was missing. You can point to the quote today all you want to that he made yesterday. And you can sit up there and say, well, this is a new Kevin Durant. What I'm saying to you is those who have watched basketball, I am very, very confident would side with me when I say, well, it makes sense that that may have been what he was thinking all along because on far too many occasions, it never came across like, Oh, my God, there's a, such a level of urgency. I've got to win now, and Kevin Durant is going all out. The person we attributed that mentality to was Russell Westbrook. And here's the shame. It wasn't Durant. Here's the shame of it. Because he's on the Golden State Warriors, and they did just win 73 games, and they Even gave him a couple minutes. He ain't going to get credit for it. He's not going to get credit. Right. Even if yep. he wins the championship this year, he has not necessarily shown that there is a way that's not the MJ, Kobe, mm -hmm. Bird, Magic, cutthroat killer, I only care about winning way.
And he's got to be aware skeptics are going to think that when he made that decision. By the way, that wasn't just prime time who made that speech. It was also Shannon Sharp as well. Let's remember that. Yep. On the latest edition of Caught Offside, first impressions last a lifetime. We give ours from the first week of the EPL season. Plus, what's the deal with the new Premier League Man of the Match award trophy? Check us out on iTunes or the Listen tab of the ESPN app. Our next guest was the number one overall pick in the 2016 WWE Draft by Raw. He is a two-time WWE heavyweight champion, and he will battle Finn Balor for the inaugural Universal Championship this Sunday at SummerSlam at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn on WWE Network. We welcome Seth Rollins to the desk. Thank you so much for being here. Dude, thank you guys for having me. This is awesome. Man. It's awesome for us, too. This is fantastic. I've watched you guys... I watched the show for years, so to be a part of it, be on Sports Center and do this, dude, it's awesome just being on campus here. Appreciate you being here. We love it. You are welcome anytime. So let's talk about this man, Con Conor McGregor. He's recently been calling everybody out, and he said in the WWE that the New Age wrestlers are dweebs and that he would slap the head off the entire roster. Um, what would your be your response to McGregor? I mean, I've tried to stay quiet on the whole issue up until this point because A, jump the shark, and B, I feel like it's just Connor being Connor. You know, he's coming off a big loss, right? Got a big, big fight this Saturday, and, and a second loss is, is not going to be good for him. So he's talking all the talk he wants, to, all the smack he wants to, to try to get as many eyes on this fight as he can, so that if he wins, He's an even bigger star. So I get it. I understand what he's trying to do. I don't really want to play into it, but, I mean, you look at how he dresses, and you look how I'm looking today. You look clean. <laughs> Who's the dweeb is what I'm talking about. Who's the real dweeb here? But not, you know, I got to ask this question, and listen, I, I respect all fighters because uh, bottom line is the athleticism, the way you got to take care of yourself, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things deserve to be respected. But when we look at wrestling in today's day and age, then you look at the UFC, you know, and you see what they do. And what they, like you said, you look good, you take care of yourself. You see some of these dudes, they're, they're, they're pretty beat up for crying out loud yeah, man. Uh, because of how, I mean, when you think about it, do you feel like there's just this lack of respect for WWE athletes overall because of that? I, I think for the most part, uh, if we're talking specifically about UFC and the fighters there, I feel like there's a mutual respect between WWE and UFC because they know what we go through and we know what they go through as athletes, as people who are you know constantly trying to keep themselves healthy and in shape and stuff like that, and with the training regiments involved. Um, you know, I think Connor's an exception to that, and, and again, it may just be Connor being Connor. But at the end of the day, I do feel on a grander scale that people don't fully appreciate what we go through. I mean, we are on the road 250, 300 days a year. I wrestled over the last three years 200 matches a year. And that's, you know, all across the world. And I, you know, I just come back from a knee reconstruction surgery six and a half months after I had my surgery. Uh, so I'm an athlete in every sense of the word. And I feel like I am. And I think it's just taking time for the general public to understand that we go through all the same rigors and injuries and training that a regular athlete goes through. So definitely a disrespect, but I don't think it's intentional. I think, you know, just the way the industry was for so long, we almost brought it upon ourselves, and now we're having some, take some time to cut, try to try to fix that a little Scott, bit. Speaking of which, Brock Lesnar's a guy who shows that that WWE participant can actually fight. He was heavyweight champion of the world. But recently he was busted for, I mean, I, I, I suppose that Conor McGregor's not referring to him, to Brock Lesnar, when he talks about who's, you know, also in the W, also in the UFC, or was, and, and, you know, obviously a much heavier weight division than Conor and was a champion. But he was busted for PEDs and accepted back into the WWE. Does that, is there a difference in terms of the PED policy uh, in your own mind, because in one case, these guys are actually fighting, trying to hurt each other. And in the other case, though it is athletic, it's entertainment. Um, I don't know if there's much of a difference. And I don't know what the UFC punishment is for what he's going to be doing or what, what he what he failed for. And uh, and I don't know what it's going to be if it pertains to WWE. You know, that's that's TBD at this moment. Mm -hmm. I'm mostly concerned about my situation. And, and I know what I'm tested for. I know how I'm taken care of. And our wellness policy is in place. Um, not so much for performance enhancing situations, but to keep our, our talent healthy, you know, because we had a terrible, you know, history before we put the system in place of wrestlers dying early. 
And we wanted to, you know, put a stop to that because the, the company cares about its talent. We care about each other as family, as friends, performers, all that stuff. And we want to take care of everybody. So the system is in place now. And like I said, it's not so much for performance enhancing because obviously we know the, the drill with WWE. We know the whole thing. Um, but it's to keep everybody healthy, and I think that's the right way to do things. I'm a huge proponent uh, of the system being in place for us. Uh, I got no problem uh, being a part of it, and, and, and I, you know, I've never failed the test, so Let, it's fantastic for us. Let's speak to you personally in terms of your popularity within the WWE. Now, you're talking to a guy. I know this, you might find this very, very difficult <laughs> to believe. We've been talking during a commercial break. You seemed a little bit shocked there, but, uh, I mean... I'm not a guy that just loves my boxing. I loved me the WWF before it became the WWE. Jimmy, super fly, slipper. I mean, you talk about Randy rope. Macho Man Savage. You talk about the yeah, Ultimate man. Warrior. You talk about man. Rowdy Roddy Piper. You talk about Hulk Hogan. Bob I Backer. mean, I used to watch the NWA with 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 uh, with, uh, with uh, Ric Flair and the Four Horsemen, Magnum TA. <laughs> you know, the Road Warriors, the American Dream, NWO, Slaughter, the NWO, the, all of that stuff. Yeah. yeah, the NWO, all of that stuff, right? So I must ask you. You know, you 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 know, as every Heavyweight champion, The Rock, Goldberg, one of my all-time favorites. I love me some Goldberg. Here you are, Seth. I mean, I'm wondering what's it like trying to fill those shoes because there's been some really, really popular heavyweight champions in the WWE. Yeah, and you guys just threw a lot of names in there. <laughs> that's right. And that's, that's an incredible legacy that we built up over years and years and years, not just in WWE, WWF, WCW, NWA, you know, all the Southern territories. Uh, and, and that's incredible that I get to be a guy as a former champion. To me, I looked up to all those guys that you mentioned. So for me to be in that company is incredible. Uh, as far as filling their shoes, I'm not interested in filling anybody's shoes. I'm interested in wearing my own shoes. And I think I've done a great job over the last four years that I've been with WWE and even my time before that, cementing my own legacy, uh, hopefully creating a Hall of Fame career to where, you know, one day, you know, future generations are sitting at this table and they're talking about Ric Flair, Seth Rollins, Hulk Hogan, Shawn Michaels, Triple H, Andre the Giant. I just want to be in the mix with those guys. Forgive me for not knowing the answer to this question. You ever fought Goldberg? No, Goldberg was retired. All right. I mean, what 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 if Goldberg come out of retirement? You want to fight Goldberg? I would fight Goldberg. You'd any fight day of the week. You'd fight Goldberg. I would any fight day of Goldberg week? any day of the week. Bring Goldberg back. I will take him on any time. I would love you, you, to be you, in the ring you with Goldberg. You beat Goldberg? Look, I am a young buck. I am a young stallion. No offense to Goldberg, but his day has come wait, wait, and gone. Wait, 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 are you trying to imply that Goldberg is old? Is that what you're saying? That what you're I may saying? or may not be saying. Oh, you may or may not Bill be saying. Goldberg. You sound like Max right now. Wait, 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 are you saying it or you're not saying? All right, I'm saying it. Goldberg's past his prime, and he can't hang with me. Oh. Bottom line, that's what I'm saying. Let me stop. Let me not stop right there. Forgive me. What about the Rock? Oh, what about well, the Rock? No, look, the Rock. Can you smell what the Rock is cooking? Yeah, I, I mean, what about it, the Rock? It smells like sweet garbage. That's what it. Oh. That's what it smells like. The Rock comes in when he wants to come in and collects his paycheck, but he's not on the road with me every single week making this place. But he it did is. that before he became a oh, great actor. Get out did of he town. not do that, sir? Get did out of town. I mean, don't you want to act? Don't you? Don't you? Don't are you? Are you not going to be? Don't you want to be washed up? Don't you? Don't, stop, <laughs> stop, 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 yeah. that. Yeah. Watch this, man. Right don't there. Don't you say that about the Rock? Well, I'm saying from his point of view. If these guys are washed up, that's where you want to get to, right? Even the Rock, the Rock is doing a great job on Ballers on HBO. We we know he's doing a great job. Yeah. But but when you're great, you can step away and come back like a him or like a Goldberg, and they could they they could possibly they could possibly take you. No, son. the Rock is the Rock is fantastic. I love him. He's a great actor. I'm happy for what he's doing. He has come back a couple times, and the Rock and, and they, I. No, look, the Rock and I have had we we've, we've intermingled a little bit. And I've gotten the better of The Rock. I put The Rock through a table, mind you, a few years ago. I know you probably didn't know that. I came out in the dark, put The Rock through a table. Oh, and, and you're proud of that? You oh, came out of the dark? Absolutely. And put him through a table, you're proud of that? Look, it's I mean, not, a, it's not always brawn versus brawn. Sometimes it's brain versus brawn. And if The Rock doesn't want to use his brains, he's going to get handled. That's just how it is. Are you afraid as a result of that you will never be able to break into Hollywood? That The Rock will block you? <laughs> Please don't blacklist me, Rock. If you got to roll on ballers for me, I'm all yours. So I just want to make sure I'm clear. You, you, you. You, on this show, you uh -huh. just said that you would take Goldberg. Yes. And you just said that The Rock is garbage. Yes. No, I, I said what The Rock is cooking is sweet garbage. That's oh! Exactly, that's so what exactly The Rock what is cooking yeah. is sweet garbage. Yes. What The Rock <laughs> is cooking is sweet garbage. Look, I'm not afraid. I'll take them both on, one-on-one, -on -one, same time, triple threat match. It doesn't matter. After Sunday, I'm going to be the universal champion, first ever, mind you, and I will take on 
all comers, past, present, future. You mean future, the first Universal doesn't... Champion? Explain that. Well, we got a new title. Okay. Uh, WWE just split brands, so we have half Raw, half SmackDown. The WWE World Champion, Dean Ambrose, is on SmackDown, right. so Raw needs to create a new title. We've got the WWE Universal Championship match. Myself, Finn Balor, live SummerSlam, WWE Network this Sunday. Uh, going to be you a worried about Yeah, Finn why'd Balor? you call him out? What, what's that? Fame? Demon King, yeah. yeah. Well, I wanted to see what I was dealing with. You know, I heard all this talk about the Demon King and his painted up persona and whatever he's bringing to the table, and I wanted to see what it was all about. So, got a little taste on Monday. Didn't exactly go in my favor, but Sunday, now I know what I'm looking for. You know what I'm saying? You have to take some to get some. You want to make an omelet? You got to break a few eggs. Let me ask you this. You're a Bears fan, right? <laughs> Absolutely. You, can you repeat to him what you say about his quarterback? Jay Bears fan? Is Horrible. Oh, oh come on, man. man. Set, 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 set. Who I'm else do you want to throw in the ball in Chicago? Come on, come on. I don't, I'm not questioning his talent. Okay. But as, because I know he can throw the football. I know he's got a presence. Oh, look, I know he's got the talent. Up, I'm not backing up. I'm getting to my point. I was on the record. I consider him to be the worst quarterback in football because, that, he's, a, because he's not a leader. He's not a leader. Are you a leader? I am 100% right, a leader. Then you know what required leaders are required to do. Is that Jay Cutler? Uh, is, are you going to sit here and say that's oh, Jay Cutler? Oh, look, Jay See, Cutler, comes at you like Jay Cutler, Cutler is my respond. quarterback. He is my quarterback, and I will stand behind him until he is oh, not so my we're being emotional. So that's what we do. We're being emotional. That's how because it's going to be. You don't Happy. believe. You just want to support him. Step, I, I got it. Step, I got his back. Tepid response. For you me? Can, I'm saying if The Rock comes at you like that, if Goldberg comes at you like that, if the Demon King comes at you, and Look, you go back at him, you're going to lose your title, bro. No, Jay Cutler is my quarterback, and he's going to take this team A to the playoffs Where? this year. <laughs> a to the playoffs this That's year. Funny. That's funny. Division really title. Funny. And look, I'm going on the record right title. now. The Chicago Bears are going to win the Super Bowl this year. Oh, stop Chicago it. Bears are going to win the Super Bowl this with year. That really? statement. Why? You don't know? That's why they play the games, right? You know. That's why they you play know. the games. You know. No, I don't know. They need you to totally know. No. The Chicago Bears. Aaron Rodgers. The Super Bowl? Aaron Rodgers really? is on the downslide. What? He's on the downslide. The Vikings can't put a team Can together for more than three years at a time. Aaron Rodgers is on the downslope of his career. All right. He is. He is Taking on the shots back at the rock. Oh, Aaron Rodgers. Do you have the audacity to be so blasphemous? What are you blasphemy? I mean, I mean, I'm talking. You, we're talking. We're talking about. You talk about Goldberg. Woman. You talk about the Rock. And if yes. now you're defending. Jay Cutler, I'm disrespecting that, is my that quarterback. man that is Aaron Rodgers. Look, that's your quarterback. Hey, he may win a passing title this year. You don't know. He's got a, a healthy Alshon Jeffrey. Hey, we don't know if he's healthy. Kevin we don't know if he's healthy. Is we don't know if he's healthy. Exactly. We don't know if he's healthy. Exactly. Don't know if he's healthy. Exactly. Don't know if he's healthy. You lost Matt Forte. Keep going. Uh, he's past his prime. Really? Anyway. He's in New York. He's going to oh, rush for he's 500 with Goldberg. yards. Oh, yeah, really? he's hanging out with Bill on set somewhere. All right. Him and Dwayne and Bill you know are what, hanging man? out somewhere on You're going to be I'm hanging out watching. Sunday, and we can't wait. By the way, yes. I predict you're going to win this week, and I think you're going to be fine. I don't know if that's a good or bad omen. <laughs> you're gonna, but, but you're going to lose to Goldberg, though. That's just not going to happen. He's okay. too afraid to come out of retirement and face me. Period. Seth, thank you so much for being with us. Be sure to check out SummerSlam on WWE Network this Sunday. We'll all be watching. Come by anytime. We appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me. Battle with you. More first take after the break. <laughs> it's even a feisty. In a piece for the undefeated, former NFL cornerback Dominique Foxworth pleads to Aaron Rodgers to add his voice to the Black Lives Matter protest. Currently, the expectation of athletes to take a stand on social issues falls only on black athletes, as if we're the only athletes with the responsibility for the advancement of society. I assume you agree with me when I say every person has an equal obligation to advance our society, black or white, celebrity or not, athlete or fan. So please, be the leader I believe you are. Be the first white superstar athlete to accept some of the burden black athletes are currently shouldering alone and say black lives matter. Stephen A., should Rogers speak out more? Yes, he should. But I think that where I disagree with the article, uh, which I, 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 you know, I haven't read it in its entirety, but I saw those quotes, where I disagree with it somewhat is, pin, is, is pinning it on Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. I think any white star in professional sports that has reach, that has cachet, that has the ability to galvanize folks to listen and hear what they have to say should be conscientious enough to speak up. You don't have to wax eloquently or attempt to about issues you're not familiar with. But I do think it's incumbent upon you to say something. Um, I don't believe it's incumbent upon Aaron Rodgers to step forward and to say black lives matter. Um, I've been on, you know, I took heat from 
you know, Black Lives Matter because I said maybe there was a problem with your with your name because it should have said Black Lives Matter too. You know, as a pope, but I do understand Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, uh, my man Joe Madison for Sirius XM and others, you know, explained to me what that was or, or what that was all about, why the word too wasn't deemed necessary. And I appreciate them educating me on that. But the bottom line is this. I think that as black people, we have to accept something here. Uh, white folks are not black. And as a result, the level of sensitivity that we have towards certain issues, they may not have. Now, that doesn't mean they, sh they shouldn't speak out. That shouldn't mean that when there's injustices that are taking place, that we all shouldn't be a universal voice in our society. But at the same time, it amazes me how on so many occasions, we as a black community expect and anticipate that those outside the black community are going to have more sensitivity towards our issues than as we should. It doesn't work that way. It would be nice if it were that way. It would be incredibly beneficial when you think about civil rights and civil rights legislation and the battle and the fight for civil rights, how it took place and how there were some white folks that stepped into the fray and assisted black folks in making sure uh, that we ultimately were able to acquire those rights. The flip side to it is that as we've evolved as a society, as we've seen more and more people from all walks of life suffering and struggling the way that they do. The fact of the matter is, is that we would like folks to be sensitive to our plight, but we shouldn't anticipate and expect them to. And more importantly, we shouldn't expect anybody to help us more than we're willing to help ourselves. And so as a black community, I think it's incumbent upon us to recognize that while we want people out there to help and assist us in our goals in fighting off demons that continue to sift through our communities like viruses, it's incumbent upon us to do for ourselves, to do as much for ourselves as possible. So when we want assistance from somebody else, it's plausible that we may receive it because they're looking at us as an example to assist with and to follow as opposed to us just screaming at them as to what they should be doing instead of the, uh, focusing on what we should be doing for ourselves. Yep, although it's incumbent upon everybody to speak out against injustice, I think, wherever they find it, particularly egregious injustice. Um, and, and I think Foxworth's point, and I, I hope I'm representing him properly here, is that Rogers in particular, as the best player in the world, as a guy who's shown political, a political orientation that suggests, or at least a social orientation, that suggests that he would be sensitive to this issue, who has shown intelligence. Foxworth's asking him to take the next step in terms of showing the courage and the kind of um, forward-thinking point of view that he would come out now and show sense and say the words, Black Lives Matter. Now, and, and by the way, it would be nice, as an, uh, you know, to add to that, if it wasn't because all lives matter, because as you said, it's Black Lives Matter parenthetically too, because in this country it has not, oh, it's obvious Black Lives Matter. No, in this country it's it is not obvious. obvious most of the time that Black Lives do not matter throughout the history of our accurate. country. That is accurate. That is okay. accurate. Here's my problem with it. Black Lives Matter as a slogan, as an idea, I like very much. Black Lives Matter as an organization and movement has now put out a political platform which includes ideas that maybe someone like Aaron Rodgers or others, white or black, wouldn't be comfortable supporting, including the immediate release and retroactive decriminalization of prostitution and, and drug offenders and their records should be expunged. Maybe not everyone's going to agree with that. Divestment uh, uh, from Israel, they point out, is the example of the country. That was one of them. Right. I mean, there are, th this is a platform that is, that the idea of Black Lives Matter is uncontroversial or should be to any intelligent, evolved person. But these ideas, this platform, is not going to be so obvious and is going to be controversial. And so once Black Lives Matter presents a, a, a political platform, mm -hmm. then using that slogan, which on its face is completely correct, is associated with a host of other ideas that maybe Aaron right. Rodgers or others wouldn't be yeah, comfortable and, supporting. And, and that's, th those are fair points, but to bring it back home to Aaron Rodgers, I don't want to hear Aaron Rodgers. It, I, I, let me take that back. I understand Aaron Rodgers' name coming up in Foxworth's column 
if you're piggybacking directly off of what has transpired in recent days in Milwaukee. Okay? The riots that broke out, you know, burning cars, you know, some of the violence, et cetera, et cetera, because a police officer shot, you know, a, 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 you know, shot a black man. But let's keep in mind, the black man that was shot had a gun. We don't know all the details because we may find out that there's some transgression that took place we don't know. But from what we know, there was a black individual shot. The officer who shot him was black. What does Aaron Rodgers have to do with that? I'm just asking the question. We also got to take into account the fact that just an hour and a half away in the streets of Chicago, we still got a problem that's existing there. That's why we'll be there next week. That's why the undefeated is going there next week, because there are shootings that have been taking place in Chicago at record numbers, which has alarmed all of us. We've got black folks saying the president needs to speak up and say more because he's a junior senator from that area. And we hadn't heard enough from him in all likelihood because Rahm Emanuel, his former chief of staff, is the mayor in Chicago right now. We don't know. We just know that we would like to hear more from him on what's been taking place in Chicago. What I'm saying is, in closing, is this. Once again, black, you know, uh, 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 you know black victim, black police officer, Milwaukee. Black on black crime in Chicago, African-American president who would, we would like to hear more from on the issues in Chicago. Yes, it would be nice if white folks would join in and assist in any way we can, because this is America. Y'all do make up 66 percent of the population and we would greatly appreciate any assistance that you conscientiously are willing to provide. However, in the end, it still comes down to what the black community is willing to do with and for the black community in order to move forward. And that ain't on Aaron Rodgers. But, yeah. Although he should come on this show to discuss it with us, Stephen A. I wouldn't we say would that. that. Well, he don't need to. He, listen, he could just come on the show because he's Aaron Rodgers. Period. Yes. Thank and you. as you alluded to, the undefeated holding a town hall on Thursday in Chicago discussing athletes and social issues. And then we will be there the next on morning. Friday and also reacting and getting involved in all of it. So we're looking forward to that. So the Baltimore Ravens, they were plagued by injuries last season. They had 20 players on IR, the most ever by a John Harbaugh team. Joe Flacco missed six games. Baltimore also gets Justin Forsett, Steve Smith, Terrell Suggs, and many more back. Now Suggs believes the Ravens have a shot at going from a 5-11 and team to a championship team, saying, quote, I would have to say since our Super Bowl year and the year before, I think this is the best we've looked since then. You hear that, Stephen A.? You know what? I know this is hard to believe, but I believe them. Okay. And I'm going to tell you why. Because when you think about that Super Bowl team, yes, we hear the names Ray Lewis and we hear the names Ed Reed and guys like that. Let me be clear. You're talking about two future Hall of Famers, two right. of the greatest defensive players in history. Nothing but profound respect and reverence to those guys. But they were on the tail end of their careers, basically retired after that, literally in the case of Ray Lewis. So when you look at it from that perspective, nothing can replace what's up here, and I'm willing to concede that. But in terms of what the body, in terms of speed, athleticism, coverability, et cetera, can allow, I think a legitimate case can be made that they certainly weren't what they used to be, even at that time that they ended up winning the Super Bowl. You got to remember, when Sanford, when the lights went out, OK, and the game was delayed and all of that other stuff, even though San Francisco was assisted by that. A lot of people felt like the only reason why San Francisco didn't end up with the Super Bowl championship is because they ran out of time because they came storming back in the second half. Having said all of that, you just look at it. You look at Suggs being back. You look at Brandon Williams. You look at Jernigan, Urban, Dummerville, Mosley, Orr, Smith, and all of these guys. You know what they can do defensively. You know what Harbaugh can do as a coach. And then offensively, you've got a Flacco who's already proven he's a Super Bowl champion. He's not great, but he can get it done, particularly in big games. For set is one of the other reasons why you haven't heard much about Ray Rice, because after all, Ray Rice, uh, you know, it, you know, it, the controversy he got himself in, domestic violence, etc. I believe that community would have forgiven him had he not opened his mouth against the owner. But in the end, what it comes down to is you can afford to be without him because he ain't for set. Then we've got Steve Smith coming back. And I know that he's coming back from the Achilles. I get all of that. 
but he's Steve Smith. I don't care that he's 37 years of age. He's got the heart of a lion. He finds a way to get it done. They were calling him done before last year. And before he went down, he was averaging more than 95 yards a game. Steve Smith can ball. And I believe that he will be a, will he be a superstar? Anything like that? He doesn't have to be. As long as he's somebody that can step up and get it done with Aikens and, 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 and just, I think it's Jessica or whatever, the tight end. The bottom line is this. I just look at Baltimore being hard-nosed, the rough riders that they are, I believe they can make some noise. And even though I still think the Steelers could win that division, I could see Baltimore making it rough and possibly getting a wild card spot in the playoff picture. And once the playoffs begin, all bets are off. I see what's happening here. You're a Steelers fan. And you're trying to appease the football gods with all this Raven talk. They got the, the, you know, the divisional rival's gonna play you tough, so you're a little more impressed well, with that. Well, that should would, be. that would make you a bit clueless because for a Steeler fan to appease a Raven fan, you yeah. clearly don't know Steeler well, fans. Well, you're we a little more that. impressed with the Ravens we don't do that. than the evidence indicates. Now, Steve Smith is inspirational. Steve Smith's not what he once was, but he's a money on the line type player. Joe Flacco, money on the line type player. I get it. Problem is, money's not gonna be on the line. They're not good enough. Let's look at last year. The defense allowed 25.1 points a game. They're most in any season since 1996. They allowed 30 passing touchdowns, the most in franchise history. There's your Ravens defense. Even when Flacco was healthy last year, behind that O-line or whatever you want to call it, he won any good. He, the, the to a total QBR of 41 was the second worst among starters in the NFL. The only guy who was worse was Nick Foles, who had an historically bad season last year. So do I think under pressure, Flacco and Steve Smith and the like could come through? If the money's on the line, could they? Yeah, but what makes you think the money's going to be on the line in a division with your Pittsburgh Steelers, even though they're somewhat diminished, a bend-but-don't-break defense in Pittsburgh, which, by the way, should be a little bit improved. Even without Martavis Bryant and Le'Veon Bell, they're still going to have a great offense. Everyone knows it. Roethlisberger and Antonio Brown, of course. D'Angelo Williams. And the Bengals are one of the most well-rounded teams in the NFL. And last year, we didn't get to see Dalton in the playoffs because he got hurt. But there was, there was evidence, if you're looking for some, that maybe he's turned a corner in terms of those clutch moments. He was better in the fourth quarter than he had been in, in previous fourth quarters in previous seasons. He seemed to get better as the game went on. In the bigger games, the more the primetime games, he played better than he did otherwise. There were little indicators like that. But even without those indicators, that's for like the playoffs. The Bengals on paper are clearly, clearly better than Baltimore. In fact, I think the Browns whoa, whoa. have improved, and they're comparable to Baltimore. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, that, 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 whoa. Now you, you're smoking something. Did you just say that the Cleveland Browns are on the same level as the simmer. Baltimore Ravens? Yeah. You've got simmer. to be crazy. That is nonsense. You know what? Cleveland's it's, defense alone, there's nothing to discuss. I just, just said Baltimore's it, defense. It, 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 30 passing touchdowns. Wait, 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 first of all, second half of the season, they look much better than the first. They, 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 got, they got Eric Weddle at the safety spot. You're getting Terrell Suggs back. Orr's good in coverage. You're moving C.J. Mosley over to the middle linebacker spot. You've got John Harbaugh still coaching that team. I'm sorry. I'm not sleeping on Baltimore at all. Not to mention the fact that they got heart with Cincinnati. All the talent. They always have all the talent. I'm not betting my money on any team that can't win a daggone playoff game in a decade under in, Marvin Lewis. Now, I know we're talking about in that season. division no. at best. Me. Baltimore's third best listen, at listen. best. And I'm telling you, I think number two. I think I, I think Ahead they can move on. Cincy. Yes, I believe that. I really believe that. I really they believe that. Twenty guys you know on the IR last year. Listen, 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 gonna, I believe that's right. Twenty yeah. guys on the IR last year. But not only that, I'm gonna tell you what. Because I don't believe in Cincinnati. She knows. Everybody knows. I don't believe in Cincinnati. I've had Cincinnati Bengals right up in my face, told them straight to their face. Y'all got all the talent in the world. Y'all worrying enough. Yeah, I love you this time win, of year. If you will win another year, if you will win another year, everyone another believes uniform, everyone's gonna be good. Listen, the Suggs is confident. Were, of course he's. Oh, we're gonna be the. Of course. No, no, no. Wait a minute. It's not about what he believes. It's about what his resume proves. Oh, Terrell Suggs. Terrell Suggs has come back from injuries before and played lights out. Don't sleep on the brother. T Sizzle is T Sizzle for a reason. So let's be clear I about mean, that. You call him T Sizzle. Cincinnati. I know he's a good Cincinnati. player. Cincinnati. I don't mean they're going to be good. What has Cincinnati done to prove to you that? Don't get me wrong. 
talent wise, they are Super Bowl contenders, talent wise. Okay. But the flip side to is it, that, what is they, what have they ever proven on the field? We're, we're, you're already in the playoffs. We're, I'm talking about the regular well, I'm season. I'm just saying, right to, but I'm saying, so how if many, you have two teams how many demonstrably times better than you in the regular season, how are you going to get to the playoffs? Oh, please, let me tell you something right now. I think Cincinnati final. You're going to bet your money on Andy Dalton? Oh, in the regular season over this Baltimore squad? Yes. Hell yeah. Okay. We'll find out. We'll find out. I like that. I like that. Uh, I, li- I like that. I like that because see what I love about it because because Andy Dalton was great last because, year. Because it, just in case you try to flip, you're on camera now. You're on camera. I'm gonna flip. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 You, yeah, yeah. Did you miss every yeah. Bengals game yeah. last year? Right, you know, we gotta go. Go. Unfortunately, I didn't. I saw games that they won, but I obviously also saw games they lost, including when they collapsed against Pittsburgh well, because they couldn't keep their heads that, off. That oh. is the truth. They didn't have their okay. quarterback. Shots about fired. That. All right. Scuppered side ESPN.com here on the latest edition of Hockey Today, the podcast. We hear from Ryan Murray of the Columbus Blue Jackets and Team North America and Tyler Sagan, Dallas Stars scorer and member of Team Canada. You can find it under the Listen tab on your ESPN app. So what's up, man? Why did you need to see me? What kind of manpower do you have at your disposal these days? The best kind. Solid group, talented, loyal. Discreet. Come on now. How long have we known each other? How long will it take you to round them up? How soon do you need them? Yesterday. I'll make the arrangements. We'll also get you any information on any bank transfers in case Julian hires somebody to move the money. He'll need to pay his way. Probably his sister, Ava. You know, you know she's already on the list. So glad you helped me with this. Because I tell you what, if the, if the court won't exact justice on Julian, You'll make the arrangements. <laughs> you got us. You got everybody. The hitter. Smooth. I I think it's pretty good. I'm doing all right. You're I'm doing, doing right. more than all right. I'm doing all right. You're doing, I'm doing more all right. Than all right. It's cool. It's is cool. that what the pinstripe is about today? Is it yesterday? No, it's a new suit I had. I think I'd probably try to rock it today. That's all. You know what I love? My phone was blowing up yesterday. It's my aunt. Stephen H. back in General Hospital. No. She loves it. I must say. It's her favorite I, show I as well. I must say, you know, obviously it's soap. So there's a whole bunch of women that watch the show. Yep. I want to say to all the women, all the ladies out there that are General Hospital fans, I love y'all. They've shown me say nothing hi but to love. My aunt Linda they've show, they've shown me, they've shown me nothing but love. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. But I'm touched. Thank y'all. Good. Y'all very much. Good. 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 Thank you. Thank you. He's coming back because it's about to get. You know, it's oh, got to after another that. Level. It's, it's a bunch of, just setting it's, it's up the arrangements. some scenes coming up with Sonny Corinthos. So you, you don't want to miss General Hospital in the coming weeks. I'm telling y'all that right now. So I'm going to have to go out there and, you know, take a Do few your more thing. scenes, you know. All right. Yeah, yeah. I'll be back. We love it. Brick will be back. Okay. <laughs> Brick will be back. I'm jealous. <laughs> you going to play a gangster on TV. Right? That's the That's dream. That's right. That's the dream. Let's get into our next topic now. Cowboy star receiver Des Bryant has never lacked confidence, but now it's on a different level. Bryant was asked this week if he thinks he's having the best training camp of his career, and he didn't hesitate telling the Dallas Morning News, hell yeah, my mind is right, my confidence sky high right now. I think it's the best it's ever been. Max, yep. are you as confident in Dez and the Cowboys? In Dez, yeah. Dez is a baller. Also a great teammate, a great like he gets criticized for nonsense. Like I the, the criticism of him is ridiculous. He's an elite wide receiver, one of my favorite players to watch. Love that guy. But what difference does it make if he's confident, even if he's on the field? And he can stay on the field when his quarterback's never going to stay on the field, Stephen A. Romo's not going to be upright the entire season. And Dak Prescott, there is reason to be encouraged for a half of preseason football. But that doesn't mean that he's an actual NFL quarterback over the course of long stretches of the season, for which, if you look at Romo's recent history and the fact that he has a chronic back problem and you look at his age, Dak Prescott's going to have to be that guy. I mean, the odds are against that. When, if the Cowboys were actually at full strength, they're clearly the class of the NFC East. If, but you know, stop right there. That? Stop, yeah. stop, stop. What did you just say? If, if they're Tony at full Romo, strength, if Tony, Tony Romo and the Cowboys are at full strength, yeah. no, 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 I'm calling you out. I'm calling you out. Bring it. You have been wanting for three weeks now. Three weeks you've been on the show. Three weeks. And I, I, there's not a damn day that goes by on the air or off the air, Max Kellerman, where you haven't looked me in my face and said to me, quote, 
The New York Giants are it. They're winning the That's NFC right. East. You did not say if Tony Romo goes down. You said as long as Eli Manning is playing, it, they will be just fine. Cause they got Odell Beckham Jr. That's what you said. So I don't want to hear anything. Tony Romo, healthy or not, ain't supposed to have anything to do Pop with your quiz. position. What's the best ability? Availability. Availability. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Tell me, Eli, tell me, tell me, tell me. I'm not talking, talking about Eli's there. I'm not, I'm not talking about play. Yes, the reason the Giants should be considered the favorites, they've added to the team, obviously, to the draft that everyone has, and especially free agency on defense. Wait a minute. Keep they going. May have they Keep may have going. paid A-plus dollars for B-plus players, but they're still B-plus players on the defense. The Giants. And they, the Giants. And they have a quarterback come who's out. under center for all right the then, all right season. then, all right then. So why is your position on the Giants contingent on Tony Romo? That's not what you said for the last two weeks. Because Romo is not available all the time. But what if he was? No, 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 no. no. But what if? Look, my, you know who else is not available? Whoa, 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 stop, stop. I'm going to my question. Yes. My question. Yes. You said to me, right. yes or no, no matter what, as long as the Giants are healthy. No. You didn't say that? No. You didn't say that? I didn't say no matter. The tape? I that, didn't, that's a I lie. Didn't, can't find it. I never said no matter what, as long as the Giants are healthy. So in other words, I'm saying I expect so other, them to have a quarterback all year, and I don't expect that from Dallas. Oh, I see. So in other words, you're only picking the Giants instead of the Cowboys because Tony Romo yeah. might, is going to get hurt. Oh, yeah. But if Tony Romo stays healthy, if you Tony go Cowboys, Romo, If Tony Romo can make it through 16 games of the regular season, the Dallas Cowboys should obviously be the favorites in the NFC East. They have a bend but oh, don't right, break right. defense. Okay, but hey, but here's the we don't need to talk because that's exactly that's exactly we don't need to talk because that's what I told you three weeks ago. I, three weeks ago I told you oh, the Dallas oh, Cowboys. So you uh, said if Romo is healthy, no, no, I said, you're making a contingent on that. What right? I'm saying to you is this: we're making our predictions contingent on this is your roster. Yeah, who's who's no, the no, best team? No, no. And I'm we're saying making to you, predictions I, based on and reality. I, and I said to you. The Dallas Cowboys, as much as it grates my last nerve yeah. to say it about the most disillusional fan base in American history, they have the team that they should be rooting for because the Dallas Cowboys will win the NFC East no, this sir, year. That, and that's what that's we disagree what I about. I don't, when you look at that roster, look, Jason Witten is one of the all-time greats, but he was banged up all last year and was not the same guy as he appeared to be, as he had been in years past, because he's getting to that age. Des Bryant was unavailable. Even if, if he's available the whole season, it's unlikely he's going to have a quarterback there who can consistently get him the ball, because it's unlikely Romo's going to make it through the season. They're not going to have Rolando McClain <laughs> suspended for 10 games, Demarcus Lawrence, Randy Gregory suspended for the first four games. They simply don't have the, some of their roster available to them off the bat. Well, I think and secondly, the they're probably not going to have their quarterback. Let me be but I feel confident saying but, Eli's going to be but there. Let me be fair. Let me be very, very clear. I think the Redskins, on paper, should actually win the NFC East, but they won't because I think they're allergic to prosperity. I think the Giants' defense will not come through. I think the Eagles, this particular season, is irrelevant. And by default, even if Romo goes down and Dak Prescott or somebody else is your quarterback, if Ezekiel Elliott with Alfred Morris, with Des Bryant, with, Tez, with, with, with Terrence Williams, with Jason Witten, if and that offensive line, yep. if everybody else is healthy, even if Tony Romo is not, I believe the Dallas Cowboys can take the NFC East because I think the I'm NFC East sit is my highly face. suspect. Yes. Highly unlikely, which is why the Cowboys won almost no games last year. And Ezekiel Elliott's contributions behind a great offensive. Look, the Cowboys are a lot like the Steelers in that way. Really good offensive line, really good quarterback, wide out, same thing. The tight end, the whole thing. And now they got the running game, too, with Ezekiel Elliott, you'd think. But tell me the last time a Super Bowl-caliber team's offense Who said was anything about the Super Bowl? I said winning the NFC East. Or a playoff team the that got through the was based on Who the run game. The that doesn't happen listen, listen, as listen, much listen. anymore. A running game, a balanced... Lost hold on, game last hold year. on. A running game, a balanced offensive attack can win you the NFC East. So do you believe that saying. Dak Prescott, who you you were like, oh, it doesn't make a difference, couple uh, like last week, oh, Dak Prescott showing out in the preseason, it doesn't make a difference. Now you believe let he's me, enough let me, to overcome the fact that last year without Romo, you lost him well, every I, game? I, let, me, let, me let, me, let me teach you something about arguing, okay? I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to teach you something about argument, but it's necessary here. You actually don't get to make my point by not allowing me to make my point. The Dallas Cowboys... You accuse me? Yes, yes I am. Absolutely. You? Absolutely. The, oh, the, the nerve. That's the nerve. The Dallas Cowboys can win football games in the NFC East. Let's go to and the NFC East, 
throw in less than 15 times a game. Okay. With Darren McFadden, with Alfred Morris, with Ezekiel Elliott, even with Des Bryant, Jason Witten, and Terrence Williams, I'm telling you right now, as much as you're sick to my stomach as it makes me, I think the NFC East is so suspect. The Redskins actually should win it, but I think they're allergic to prosperity. I'm telling you right now, I think the Dallas Cowboys could win the division. Don't let the facts get in the way of a good argument, I Whatever. guess, huh? That's Whatever. what you're Let's talking about. Let's go to break. You're Maybe both making me mad. Derrick Rose has no shortage of confidence in his New York Knicks. A few weeks ago, Rose made headlines when he said that some people put the Knicks in the same super team class as the Warriors. Well, Rose isn't backing off those comments in an interview from South Korea. Quote, I still believe that. Like I said, with that super team term, you have to be very careful, I guess, if you're in the United States. But I feel like if you're in any team in the NBA, it don't have to be the NBA, it could be the college level, high school level, you should believe in yourself and have the confidence in yourself that you're playing on a super team anywhere. So I have a lot of confidence, and I am not taking that back. Max? Yeah. Is Rose delusional about these Knicks? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's where the confidence has to be coming from. He, he's completely delusional, and, and it shows you that if you get to a certain level of fame and fortune, you can become insular enough in terms of the people around you and in terms of what you're exposed to that you wind up believing this stuff. And I'm a Derrick Rose fan. Derrick Rose was, as a rookie, amazing. I mean, look, LeBron James should have been the MVP the year Derrick Rose won it. But Derrick Rose was in his early 20s and won MVP, and before he got hurt the following year, he was getting better. He was getting to be more of a true point guard the following year. He was an amazing talent, and he's in a contract year, another year removed from catastrophic injury. He has some interesting pieces on the Knicks. I think he'll have a good year, but a super team? This version of Derrick Rose has not been that version of Derrick Rose since then. This has been... You can't even really say an average NBA point guard because that's an extremely high standard when you think about the NBA point guards. Recently, he even brought up Courtney Lee. I love the Courtney Lee signing because he can play without the ball and hit shots and defend the best perimeter player on the other team. But Courtney Lee will never be mistaken for a starter on a super team, and I like him a lot. Carmelo Anthony seems to be in gradual decline already. Not a great defensive player. Not a natural fit defensively at the three or the four. Uh, Chris Stapps Porzingis is a potential superstar in the future on the, you know, he's ascending, but like when you, Joe Kim Noah a couple of years ago was exactly who you wanted, but he's been a shell of himself since then. So to think, Stephen A., that the Knicks are some kind of a potential super team is to not only assume that every single thing that could possibly go right is going to go right, but also that you built a time machine that can transport Derrick Rose and Carmelo Anthony and Joe Kim Noah backward and Chris Stapps Porzingis forward somehow all meet in the same place at the same time, and even then, you'd never get out of the East. How does that equate to a super team? Clearly, Derrick Rose needs to be drug tested. There is no doubt about that uh, for making the statement that he made. We cannot refute that. But here's the thing. I actually, the more I've heard these statements, the more I actually like it. <laughs> Not that I think he's accurate by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm enjoying this. Because you see, for me, success for the New York Knicks this season would be getting to Cleveland in the Eastern Conference Finals. Yep. Which means we must ask ourselves, is this plausible? I'm here to say yes. Yeah, I hope you said plausible. 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 No, plausible. plausible. You better pause that. P L, not P A. P L. P L E A S E. Plausible. 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 Let me tell you why. You know, when you look at the Eastern Conference, I know that the Boston Celtics got Al Horford. I like I like Coach Brad Stevens a lot. I like what Danny Ainge has done with that squad. I think Danny Ainge did an exemplary job and deserves a lot of credit. Boston's a team to watch out for. Toronto went to the Eastern Conference Finals, and you know how much I love my man Dwayne Casey. We know what he can do. You re-signed DeMar DeRozan, $138, $139 million. But I think that Toronto is, form uh, is, is vulnerable. Uh, Biombo losing him is, I think, is a loss. I think that Boston is not there yet, even though they've got young athletes and what have you. There's nothing definitively that they've done. They don't have a closer, somebody you could give the ball to and say, take me to the promised land. The Knicks, I believe, have that in Mellow. Who, who doesn't have it? Boston. 
Isaiah Thomas, you don't like getting to the like, rack I, when you need I love, to go? I love Isaiah Thomas, but I do believe that at times, because of his miniature stature, what have you, I do believe in playoff competition, sometimes you don't get those calls when you're the little man. I just believe that. I think that when you're mellow, you're 6'8", you're 240, you can play with your back to the basket, you go out to the perimeter, you got a mid-range game, you can shoot threes, you can get to the free throw line. Even though Isaiah Thomas is no joke and he's a miniature star in this league, I do believe that come playoff time when the game gets more physical and the referees are willing to let let you play a little bit more instead of calling games tight. I think that works against the smaller guys in my estimation. So I think that, again, both teams would be favorites over the Knicks. I just think plausible is an operative word here. We also have to take into account the fact that Porzingis is a year older, mellow, and then you look at a guy like a um, Derrick Rose. What an upgrade from Jose Calderon. And so if Derrick Rose, and they always, they usually say that once you go through an injury, it takes you that year just to make it through. There were many times I watched Derrick Rose play last year, and I, saw, I felt I was just watching a guy that was just happy to be healthy, to get through game to game and not go down. He played 66 games last year, only missed 16, all right, finished with averaging 16 and 5, not great but not horrible. The bottom line is now that he's got that year under his belt, Big upside. he's gotten healthy, and he's going to be stronger, there's an upside. Courtney Lee, I would have preferred Dwayne Wade, as we all know, but Courtney Lee's a legit 6'4", 6'5", can defend, can hit perimeter shots, and now he doesn't have to worry about a reserve role or spectating as Kemba Walker puts on the show. I think Courtney Lee will be able to do some things as well. I think when you look at the Eastern Conference, because of the vulnerabilities of everyone else outside of Cleveland, that makes it plausible for the Knicks to be in the mix if Melo steps up and is like, let me remind y'all of who the hell I am. I think Porzingis would have to take a quantum leap forward in his second season for them to even be anything like contenders, but I agree. Derrick Rose is a big upside play. Here's the issue with the Knicks. Phil Jackson is arguably the greatest coach in the history of the NBA. Sorry, Red Auerbach fans, but in, in, in the modern era, he's got 11 chips as a, as a coach. But as a GM, as a team president, Masai Ujiri, you brought up Toronto. Better. And Danny Ainge. Better. I mean, they're just, so they've constructed better, deeper rosters. They've done it more organically through the draft and targeted free agent signings. They've, these crews have played together, and I find it, a remote possibility that the Knicks could get by. I mean, every single thing would have to go right, and still I don't think they probably get by either one of those two teams, let alone Cleveland. I don't, I don't, How are they I a super We got to go, but the operative word is plausible. And remember, the Knicks have three scorers because Derrick Rose can't put the ball in a hole and Porzingis and no can't bench. put the ball in a hole. And no bench. All right, we got to leave it plausible. there, gentlemen. RG3 impressed last night as the Browns quarterback. He played most of the first half yesterday against the Falcons, completing six of eight passes for two TDs. He also ran for 36 yards on three carries. Stephen A., are the Browns going to be better than we think with RG3 at the helm? No. I mean, they're not going to be worse than the 3-13 and season that they had last year. But are they going to be much better? No. I think, I just, but I don't think it's because of RG3. First of all, it was nice to see him knowing how to slide. It's very, very important. He's saying that you know how to slide. Hitler, maybe he's been taking some baseball lessons. Maybe he's been hanging out with Terry Francona and the Cleveland Indians. Who knows? I hope he is because he ne definitely needs to slide. Uh, but <clears throat> I don't think this season is going to be great. I don't think it's going to be the fault of Hugh Jackson. I don't think it's going to be the fault of RG3. Um, I think that when you have a roster bereft of talent um, at a multitude of positions because they've basically cleaned house. They've had like 14 uh, new draft picks uh, from last April. I definitely think it's one of those situations where you look at the Cleveland Browns and you got to ask yourself, what do they have? Are we really supposed to depend on Josh Gordon to be available? We hope and pray that he will because we wish nothing but the best for him. But hoping and praying is entirely different than expecting. Uh, and so you got to look at it from that grade. Barnage, I mean, he had a good year last year. We get that. Had over 1,000 receiving yards, about 79 receptions. We get that. Duke Johnson, he can run the ball out of the backfield. But the offensive line is still sus suspect. That means the protection for the quarterback is still suspect. That means as a result of that, you're going to have to run the football more than you're throwing it because obviously you're not going to be able to create with so many ho I mean, uh, protect the quarterback as much as you would like. All those things considered, combined with the defense being highly suspect in the AFC North, and there is no question in my mind that the Cleveland Browns are destined for last place. Um, I don't think it's going to even be close. 
And as a result, they will have a miserable season record-wise, but I think a very good season in terms of recognizing progress and being on the come up. I think Hugh Jackson makes that O-line better. Uh, I think you're wrong. I think, the, I think the Browns are going to be ascending. I don't think so highly of the Ravens, and everyone is already tweeting me, oh, you said they're going to be better than that. It's possible. If I had to list them, I would list them fourth out of four teams, but I don't know. The Ravens, like, we'll see. I know the Steelers and the Bengals will be the class of that division. But let me tell you what I saw from RG3 yesterday. I saw a guy who has been properly humbled by the game. RG3 was such a phenom that he played as though he thought he could impose his physical attributes on the game. No one can do that at the quarterback position. Not even Cam Newton. Like, nobody can do that in the long run. And I saw a guy who was willing to slide, as you mentioned, who took the sack instead of trying to do too much. Still, I don't know if I'd say struggled in the short and intermediate game, but wasn't making, wasn't making those reads and completions. But let me tell you something. If you can get behind the defense, as Terrell Pryor did, as Barnage did, as, as Josh Gordon will certainly do if he's on the field, he will get you that ball. Robert Griffin III has, re not only does he have a cannon, but he has touch on those downfield passes, and that can make up for a whole well, you lot. Hope. You, well, get you hope. Behind the, get behind the well, you defense, hope. he will find well, you. Well, well, you hope. What we saw from him in his rookie season, we saw the occasional deep ball, but primarily his athleticism and his breakaway speed running north and south. He's not the most elusive runner in the world, but he will blow right by you in the past. Whether that's still the case or not remains to be seen, but he was never an elusive runner. He just had breakaway speed. And in terms of his, his deep ball, he does he have deep ball capability? Sure, but there were times where the ball flooded a little bit. It stayed up there a little bit too high, a little bit too long. And you don't have Deshaun Jackson back there. Now, let's keep in mind that even though Josh Gordon is a stud and Barnage is good and we get all of that, you're talking about Deshaun Jackson as one of the elite deep threats in the game in Washington. Didn't get too many of those. And it wasn't just because of his injury. But Gordon's an was, overall better receiver. Yes, of course, of course. But what I'm saying to you is that in the end, you have to protect him enough because, again, to throw the deep ball, you got to have time. So who and better than sure, Hugh Jackson? I'm not. Well, again, what are you talking about? Who better than? I'm saying Hugh Jackson's going to get this team steered in the right direction. Yeah, I but particularly on the this, offensive line, this they're, they're going to do I don't think. Things. I don't think it's going to be this season. I think they got too much stacked against they're them. Get in the right I think it's too soon to expect that from them. And you got way, three teams quickly. That are, 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 go ahead. The schedule. The, at Eagles, that's a winnable game. Yeah. The Eagles are no great shakes. You think the Ravens are great. They play them in Cleveland. I don't know about that game. At Miami, that's a winnable game. At Washington, Washington should win. Patriots first week that Brady's back. They're going to kill him, of course. At Titans, winnable. At Bengals, okay, the Bengals will win. Jets in Cleveland, the Jets should win. Cowboys, Romo probably won't even be available by then. I mean, I, I'm looking at that schedule. They could have as many wins as losses two-thirds through the season. They could, but they won't. Because they're the Browns, and history says so. Last several years, what is it, 2011, four wins, 2012, five wins, 2013, four wins, 2014, seven wins. That was good. Last year, three wins. This is, listen, they're moving in the right direction, but there's a reason they crash landed and just cleaned house because they don't have much, and you're not going to get it back that quick. RG3 is going to surprise some people. You know who looked all right? Jimmy G. After uh, Tom <laughs> cut his thumb there. Who is that? Who is that? Who is that? Jimmy G, the quarterback uh, for the Patriots. I don't know who that is. What's his yeah, name? Jimmy Garoppolo. Garoppolo. He looked nice in that Belichick time. system. He was all right. Gentlemen, you have a lovely weekend. It was fantastic the well, spending the I'll week the with same. you. Always. You guys have a wonderful weekend. We will see you on Monday. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. Catch First Day weekdays, 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific on ESPN2. This weekend, the Mets continue a 10-game road trip in San Francisco where they'll face Buster Posey and the Giants. Go on, Buster Posey! The Mets and Giants, Saturday at 3 Eastern and Sunday at 7 Eastern on ESPN Radio.